Howard Beck joins the program because I got to ask Howard Beck just how he saw game number two. And I'll start there, Howard. How, how did you see game number two? Who gets the credit? Uh, because in my group chat this morning, there's always <laughs> there's always the question of the day. Howard, my, the question of the day was, did the Miami Heat win or did the Denver Nuggets lose? Yeah, Which that. one was it, Howard? <laughs> Oh, it's always a combination of both. I know that's a boring answer for radio. I apologize. It's all good. Um, you know, the Heat missed a ton of open shots in game one. And when Michael Malone, you know, Michael Malone had to, like, reiter- reiterate last night after the loss that, hey, I wasn't messing around or just doing coach speak when I said I didn't think we played really well in game one when we won and that I was worried. And, you know, listen, it's always hard to know with coaches. They do play these psychological games with the public, with the media, with their own teams. But the Heat had a bunch of open threes that they would normally make in game one, and they missed a ton of them, whether that was fatigue coming off of a seven-game series and a quick turnaround, whether that was elevation, whether that was just being out of sorts in general, whether that was Nuggets defense, whatever. They were open shots, right? They weren't forced shots. So there was a reason to believe the Heat were going to shoot better in game two. And – they did by a long shot. I think they made close to, you know, somewhere around 50% of their three. So that's a big part of it. I thought Jimmy Butler was a little bit more assertive and and that mattered. Um, And yeah, look, they did make some adjustments that led to the big theme of, of, or one of the themes of last night in the post game, which was Jokic became more of a scorer, less of a playmaker. And did that throw off something with the nuggets? Maybe. I mean, they still had a chance to tie it in that last possession, uh, which Jamal Murray missing the three, as time expired but you know it's a little of everything yeah i feel like it's a little of everything but at the same time it's you kind of know who i would say your standouts are right i'm looking at this series now and we know what Jokic is we know what jamal murray is we know about jimmy butler bam Adebayo. those four right because you have to have you know the 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 duos on each team but who else is the most well who's the most important third guy for both teams right now, or the most important guy that's needed each and every game? I think with both of these teams, let me let me talk about the Heat first. Right. With the Heat, it very much changes game to game because this is not a roster of a lot of, you know, big-time star power. Right. Even, even Jimmy Butler, like Jimmy Butler produces at a level in the postseason that he never does in the regular season, or at least not with that consistency. And Bam Adebayo is this – kind of Swiss army knife type player who does a lot of things as the anchor of their defense. And he can, right. he can make plays, he passes, shoots, but they don't have the prototypical, like here's our go-to scores night in night out. So, you know, last night, you know, Gabe Vincent, the undrafted Gabe Vincent uh, yeah. scores 23 points. It's a, it's a game high and makes eight to 12 shots and, and four threes. But the next time it might be Max Struess or, you know, could actually be Caleb Barton, who actually, you know, who had a phenomenal conference finals, of course, and was in the running. Uh, you know, b- narrowly missed beating out Jimmy Butler for MVP of the conference finals. It's going to vary for the Heat from night to night as to who their top scorers are. Um, e- even after Jimmy, like you expect it to be Jimmy's going to be one of their top two, but it's going to vary around that. And there are going to be times that Jimmy could be their their third leading scorer, and they could still win a game potentially. The Nuggets. It's really been kind of a sort of a big three. They're not a big three in the way of like, you know, the old Heat team <laughs> right. you know, with, with LeBron on it. But but Michael Porter Jr. and Jamal Murray are, are, there, are the, the primary co-stars that you expect to produce next to Jokic. Um, but we've seen, you know, Aaron Gordon can have an explosive game. You know, Caldwell Pope is, is a great three-point shooter. There are other guys who may come through, but I do think they are more geared toward they need Murray and, <clears throat> and Porter to produce of course uh, porter had a a pretty lousy game last night um actually at both ends of the court (laughs) and so uh that was that was an issue for denver as well he's the host of the locked on nba podcast veteran nba reporter howard beck joining the rich eisen show you can also reach him on twitter at howard beck uh last night 15 points though uh combined by kyle lowry and kevin love two guys who have nba championship finals experience but yet you put them on the court they don't have these plays in which you go, wow. But when you think about what they've done and just, and I'm just, just saying game two, because we didn't see Kevin Love in game one, they seem to stabilize a young unit or the units that they're a part of 
that keeps them playing in the plus and never the minus? Yeah, although, as it happens, Kevin Love was a plus 18 <laughs> last night and Kyle Lowry was a minus 15, which is strange. <laughs> That's crazy, um, right? <laughs> com- well, very much so because Kyle Lowry is a guy who, on most nights, uh, especially if you've won the game, and they did, uh, Lowry, you know, he'll, you'll he look across the stat sheet and go, I ah, didn't really do much statistically, right. and then you'll look at the plus minus, and it's usually some crazy off the charts plus. Um, you know, Lowry's going to get in there and gum up things for the opposing team um, uh, just in terms of his defensive instincts, and he's going to take some charges. Uh, he's going to move the ball. He's going to find open guys. Like, he's just going to do a lot of little things at this stage of his career. He and Kevin love both, right? Like, they both had their years where they were – you know, primary weapons for their teams, you know, Lowry obviously in, in Toronto and, and Love primarily in Cleveland. And they're both past that point. But, yeah, they're both incredibly valuable. Kevin Love in this postseason, and let's not forget, Kevin Love was waived by the Cavaliers early in the season. <laughs> a, a, you know, a decision that still puzzles a lot of people around the NBA. Right. Um, but Kevin Love, even in the time he's in last night, like he didn't shoot all that great, but he made a couple early threes that helped – and, you know, those outlet passes, those full-court passes that he throws that are always on the money are huge. He grabbed 10 rebounds in 22 minutes. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, the move to put him in the starting lineup, they just needed a little bit more size against the Nuggets' front court. That seemed to help them a little bit as, as well. And, you know, the, like this is, this is the Miami Heat to a T. Whether it's Love and Lowry, who are guys who, you know, seem to have maybe outlived their usefulness elsewhere or late in their career – or whether it's, you know, Vincent and Struess and other guys who are, you know, and Caleb Martin who are cast offs by other teams, they just, you know, they, they find guys who just play a certain brand of ball who are, who are tough and tough-minded, and they get the most out of them every time. Have the Miami Heat figured out how to handle the Joker? Because we've seen it now, and this is the number, right? The 40-point the double-double for Jokic, not a triple-double, but the 40-point Double double has all been losses by the Denver Nuggets in these playoffs. Is it now that Eric Spolster has figured it out? Allow Jokic to score, do that, but we can't let him get those assist numbers. That's when they really hurt. Is this now the formula to beat the Nuggets? As we heard from Spolster post game last night, he thinks that's a ridiculous premise. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think it's a ridiculous premise. It may right. not have been the full story, but I don't think it's wrong to think that. You know, you're never allowing Jokic to score, right? The guy was 16 for 28 from the field. But um, 28 shots is the most he'd taken in any game this season, Mm. regular season or playoffs. And it's not his natural demeanor to be a a go-to scorer. Jokic would prefer to set up his teammates. It's always been the way he's been built. And that Nuggets team has thrived with him not just posting triple doubles. It's not the triple double that's the thing. It's it's the fact that one of those categories is the assists. When he is – setting up his teammates and everybody's in rhythm, it's, that's when the Nuggets are at their best. And this is not a team that's built uh, on their defense. They were, you know, a mid-tier defensive team in the regular season. So they're not going to grind you out and, and win games that way. They're going to pick you apart at the offensive end, make you work your butt off, and Jokic is going to keep finding open teammates. When he's more of a scorer as he was last night, now I should note, he had 31 points through three quarters, I believe, and they had a lead going into the fourth. So it's not that Jokic being a go-to scorer was somehow a, a weight on them. But I do think, and this is a harder thing to kind of prove, right? This is more just basketball impressionism than anything. But I think it's important for role players to be in rhythm. And I okay. think that when you get into a tight fourth quarter, guys are more comfortable if they've been involved the whole time. And so if you've been able to make the Nuggets a little bit more stagnant, and have Jokic carry them, and even if he's putting up big numbers on high efficiency, I do think it has an impact on the role guys, and I think that that can bleed into defense too. If you don't feel as involved and you're not in rhythm and you're not shooting as well, you sag a little bit. It, it's it you know it's a hard thing to prove. Like I say, it's it's more psychological, but I, I think those things are real. No, I I agree with you 100 percent because I the, the next guy I want to talk about is a guy in. Gabe Vincent, because I was I was trying to put it to all together, because you have so many of these undrafted players, and yet Gabe Vincent on this national stage, right, has I wouldn't say he's come out of nowhere, Howard, because we he's been playing in the NBA, but for some reason we've ignored him, and yet when you look at the impact that he's had on this Miami Heat team, especially right now with the ball in his hands, 
it's like, how has this dude gone on? Uncur- how is he undrafted? Where have we missed out on him? And yet, I think that he's been the most important player for the Miami Heat outside of Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. I mean, you, you can certainly make the case. And as the, the to the why he you know gets overlooked, undrafted. I mean, it happens in this league now and then. And and listen, even some of the stars in this league or the stars in this series. Nikola Jokic was a second round pick, right? Right. Jimmy Butler. Jimmy, Jimmy Butler was a thirtieth pick the year that he was drafted. Um, Bam was was a little lower in the first round. He was not a top five or top ten pick. I mean, uh, you know, Jamal Murray I think was outside, or maybe he was like seventh. Um, but there's, you know, it, 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 the player development matters. Um, the system you're in, the coaches you get, uh, teams miss. Like it, it's you know we're going to have the draft here in a few weeks and. <laughs> It, it's going to go like every other draft, I guarantee you. We're going to overhype a bunch of guys at the top. We're going to sleep on some other guys, you know, in the mid to, to late first round and the second round. And as with every year, there's going to be some guys who are picked lower who pop. It's still more art than science. Teams still miss. And you get a Gabe Vincent who he finds the right team. And the, and the Heat, generally speaking, are that, that's the team you want to land with if you're the – you know, uh, you know, hardworking, uh, high IQ player who got overlooked, didn't go to the bigger schools, all that kind of stuff. Miami's where you want to land because they're going to, if, if you uh, have a, a certain uh, commitment to the game and conduct yourself as a professional and, and play your butt off, that's the place you're going to blossom. He's the host on the Locked On NBA podcast, veteran NBA reporter Howard Beck joining the Rich Eisen Show. Kirk Morrison here filling in for Rich. Just a couple more minutes with you, Howard, because now the series shifts. It goes from Denver to Miami. We get a couple of days in between. The one thing that I keep hearing, especially from my friends who are Heat fans, is this is who we are. We're not surprised of the position that the Heat are in because they haven't been great in game ones. They haven't worked great in the play in, but yet – they find a way that next game. But when you look at the Denver Nuggets, this is the first time, Howard, that we really feel like this is a bit of adversity for them. How do you think Denver responds? It's like the first time of being uncomfortable in a series. It's actually one of the things I'm most curious about because, to your point, they really it, – it's not that they haven't been tested, right. and I'm not downplaying anything they've done in this postseason, but, yeah, they've – by virtue of being the top seed in the West, yeah, they've they've been kind of the the, the front runners in each of their series. They've never really uh, been pressed. Um, they hadn't lost at home in the postseason. They hadn't lost at home period in like you know a couple of months. And this is the first time I think that they are really kind of knocked a little off kilter and, and maybe have to deal with a little bit of of you know they're just kind of checking themselves in terms of their confidence. Um, They've lost home court advantage. They're fortunate that that uh, one of the first things Adam Silver did when he became commissioner, you know, ten years ago, was to change the series uh, format in the in the finals from the two three two back to two two one one one, because otherwise they'd be they'd be uh, looking at a one one split with three games in Miami. So, um, you know, I, I've, I all, all the belief in the world that the Nuggets, of course, can win one of those two games, get home court back, and and it'll be probably two two going back to Denver for Game Five. That's my best guess expectation but um i am curious to see how they handle this this bit of adversity because they really haven't had to to cope with that in a while and you know is are there is there a counter move if they're going to stick with kevin love in the starting lineup for the heat or the the nuggets have a move I, i don't think there's a i don't think there's a lineup move to make but maybe there are uh tactical adjustments like i said the biggest thing that i'm excited about howard was that sunday night's game too now has given us intrigue and interest now that we have a series that's deadlock 1-1 and it can go any way possible. That's what I'm excited about, Howard. Man. Appreciate the time, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. That was Howard Beck, veteran NBA reporter, the host of the Locked On NBA podcast. Follow him on Twitter at Howard Beck. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 